relevant information for us. So my daughter, who's five years old, is addicted to a variety of learning apps on the, on the devices. So she's literally working through math problems mm -hmm. at age five and getting feedback loops, communicating back with these fancy computers that say, oh, based on my daughter's response, we should offer her this harder question or maybe this easier question. And she's got a personalized learning tutor and she hasn't even started kindergarten yet. Well, we're talking about American engineers, American developers, American entrepreneurs. The information technology, uh, one of the trade groups published a study that said we are dominating the global marketplace for mobile applications. And this is creating American jobs, not just domestically, but selling these applications all over the world. One of our, we're moving on. Thank you, Anish, great. One of our double wahoos up here is Thurgood Marshall Jr., undergrad and law, right, Thurgood? Who served as secretary to the cabinet in the Clinton administration, but in my opinion only, wasn't his most interesting job. Uh, he also served as legislative assistant to Vice President Gore, and it's the job he held in January, August, actually, August of 1993, when President Clinton was coming up for a vote on one of the most memorable, controversial, and historically important budgets, you don't always hear that in the same phrase, uh, the Congress ever passed. It was August of 1993, and in both houses, the first Clinton budget was coming down to one vote, and Thurgood Marshall was there with the Vice President to count the votes. Thurgood? I was, although, you know, I, need, I probably need to acknowledge since um, Anish, I guess, called me out a little bit, you may not have realized it, but, I missed my share of classes in Charlottesville, <laughs> so <laughs> it probably would have no benefited, days. right? Yeah. We had snow days, right? <laughs> Could have benefited from that. Um, I did. I, I I did have a chance to work with Vice President Gore and and the president's legislative team during um, actually the entire first term of the Clinton presidency, and so for the run up to the the 1993 budget vote. Um, I was with the Vice President either when he was on the phone or in uh, the endless meetings to uh, line up votes for, the, for the, that package. We had, uh, it, it's been interesting to me because there's been so much discussion, particularly just over the last several months and during the Republican debates about the importance of deficit reduction. And of course, the 93 budget is one of those typical examples where uh, when you're in one of those Washington battles for six to eight months, and actually, if you include the transition planning period, there's about 10 months worth of, of effort on that, trying to line up uh, a proposal that would gather enough votes uh, for passage. Um, there's a distinctly different perspective over the almost 20-some years that have transpired since then, when um, I, I suppose we some of us Democrats shamelessly point out, um, in case those of you don't realize that there were no Republican votes for that package, I'll just remind you that since, since we regularly chant that, um, during those eight months uh, of, of lobbying for that legislation, we very much chased after Republican votes. And the President had been fortunate to pick up Republican support early in the, the administration on a number of initiatives, particularly uh, family medical leave, motor voter, and uh, tremendous support from Republican senators and House members in uh, putting nominees in position um, in the cabinet agencies. So we had a, a very much, um, in addition to a center out strategy and gathering votes for that budget proposal, uh, a plan to pick up Republican votes. There were a number of Republicans in the Senate in particular that were likely targets for us, including um, Senator Packwood or Senator Hatfield at the time. Um, Senator Bill Cohen from Maine ultimately served in President Clinton's cabinet. So there were a number of votes that we thought we were gonna get and um, toward the end it became clear that we were gonna have to hold all of our Democrats um, because we were starting to, to hemorrhage um, support with um, some of our moderate Democrats. Real quick, can you remind us why it was so controversial? Well, why it was such a big deal? It, it, um, it, there are a few things that, that will, will sound like echoes. Um, there was uh, a tax increase for the top 1% uh, in the country. Um, there, was, there was a significant battle over um, how to balance 
from from our perspective, how to put together a package that that would bring down the deficit significantly, um, provide some revenue inputs, but preserve enough um, flexibility in the budget to provide sustained economic growth. Because the president, what the president was looking for was not a quick win, but something that would be more sustained through the presidency, so that he hopefully could free up um, additional public and private investment. And so a lot of those battles continue to play out in different ways in Washington right now through the budget battle. Um, another thing that will um, sound eerily familiar is that uh, we were faced with about, it was about 20 years of stagnant growth. We uh, were given projections. Well, we, we came into office, the president came into office, unemployment had tipped over 7% and was on track to get close to 8%. Later in 1993, if if no budget were enacted, um, there was a at the time it seemed right now it seems like a small number, but at the time there was a record deficit of um, initially 290 billion dollars, which seems like a manageable number, but it was extraordinary at the time. That number had been revised during the 92-93 transition to in excess of $320 billion and was projected to continue to grow over 1993. So we're, we were um, faced with a number of, of tweaks to make sure we could hold the various votes that we needed. Um, it ended up being um, a one vote margin in the Senate. What well, was a tie vote in the Senate? The Vice President cast the tie-breaking vote. Um, at that point, Bob Kerry from Nebraska, who <laughs> since another one of these Things keep coming back. He's now running yeah. to try to win his seat once again in Nebraska. Um, was that the last vote that got the president's budget to 50-50? Um, he uh, he had indicated that he didn't want his vote to cause the president's major initiative to go down. And a similar statement was made by Marjorie Margolis Mazvinsky, who had won a seat in Pennsylvania and was a freshman member. Um, she had won her seat by just over a thousand votes. She had um, one of those districts that had one of the highest income um, profiles in the country, so she represented a lot of those one percent. Um, Democrat, lost, lost Democrat in a Republican district, exactly, yeah. and and lost her seat over that. Um, but it was uh, it set a stage for both for our lobbying efforts on Capitol Hill because it provided credibility um, once the reviews came in on the budget and it's that budget's impact um, uh, and it, it boosted the economy quite a bit. So it made it quite easy for, for us to lobby on other issues subsequently. Um, and were you, th the night that it time. came down to, uh, forgive me, the night it was 50-50 in the Senate, were you there? I was. Uh, what, we were, tell us what happened. We were, uh, we were actually throughout the afternoon on that particular day, we were in the West Wing. Um, President and Vice President um, in, in our administration were quite competitive when it came to lobbying members and would race to, to chase after gettable members. And um, we were waiting and got word that Senator Kerry was heading to the floor and caught his remarks and um, jumped in the vehicles to head up for the vote. Um, Vice President Gore, I, I was fortunate running his Congressional Affairs Office that I had a Vice President who had served in the Senate because he would often We'd lock him in his office up there, and uh, he would call his friends and stare at me and say, you know, they put me in this room and tell me that it's a close vote, and other things are going on down at the White House, and I must remain here until the vote, and usually it's not very close. Because as, as yeah. most of you know, there are a lot of um, political junkies here. Uh, Senate votes it's, tend to, even if they're close, they tend to swing hard one way or the other at the end. Um, on that instance, we knew we were going to need his vote. Um, he was in the chair, and, and he actually he, he had me take a note to Senator Mitchell, who was the, the Democratic leader, um, and, and it was sort of a play on the fact that so many members had asked for um, special provisions in that budget or elsewhere in, in the administration's policies. Um, he passed a note that said that he was wavering on his tie-breaking vote and was hoping he might be able to... <laughs> get a bridge or something in, in the and bill. Mr. Marshall, real quick, um, should the country be proud of that budget? I know you're a partisan, but I know you have a good answer to that question. 
How about if I flip it and say that I think that, that um, the, in the aftermath of that budget, the ability of, of the Congress in the late 90s to uh, complete the job in a bipartisan manner is something we all ought to uh, you know, take, take some heart from and sort of look to as a possible model for the coming months, and um, if not later this year, then early next year. Do you think that budget set the stage for the surpluses that happened later in the Clinton administration? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think one of the things that, that was pretty, actually quite striking um, was that it, it, the surpluses exceeded even our, our wildest estimates. Um, there was an internal debate in the administration during the run-up to the budget proposal over which um, statistics to use, whether to use some of our internal analysis and projections on how much income would flow from that budget or whether to use the Congressional Budget Office. Um, it turns out, the, and, and the President opted to rely publicly on the Congressional Budget Office um, projections. It turns out that uh, with the surpluses, we exceeded both. We're going to fast forward now to the Bush administration, the administration of George W. Bush. Eugene Hickok served that president. Mr. Hickok is a professor of the United States Constitution and also a double Wahoo at the master's and PhD level. So Mr. Hickok, I'm going to focus you on January 8, 2003. You were Deputy Secretary of Education. President George W. Bush was trying to herald one of his signature accomplishments, the No Child Left Behind Education Act. And the coin of the realm at the time was to get all 50 states to sign, what was it called? It was accountability plans. And the first five states were ready to announce this. In the middle of this, Mr. Hickok is called to the White House because the president had a political decision to make. Mr. Hickok, take it from there. Set the stage for you. Um, this is a and bring your mic down. Just a mic down. Bring the um, No Child Left Behind Act is sort of his number one domestic priority. This is before 911 happens. It's really the, the only substantial piece of bipartisan legislation to pass, I think, since then. Yeah. If you think about it, and um, the previous years, the previous approaches to secondary education law, most of the states had not really signed on. So they received federal dollars, but really didn't comply with the law. So here was a new law, high profile, and the goal here was to celebrate the anniversary of the passage of the law by announcing several states had already signed on, which was a pretty big deal in retrospect. Uh, two days before the event, we sent a memo, a policy decision memo, about two or three pages, pointing out a couple of very controversial aspects of the law that we wanted to make sure the president, the White House, knew about, and was ready to make a decision about because they'd have to decide this before this event and be ready for whatever political outcome happens. So we go to the White House and I go into the Oval Office along with the Secretary and in the Oval Office at that time uh, is the Vice President and most of the White House staff, the entire press office, the entire legislative staff, Carl Rove at the po politics office. And I'll be honest with you, I just looked around and thought to myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> because the stakes were pretty high. Um, frankly, he had read the memo, and as I began to make a presentation, he started asking me questions. Uh, didn't even get my first presentation out. He read the memo, what about this, what about that, what about this, what about that? I'm trying to answer the questions as well as I can. I'm struck with the fact that this is a president who really knows this stuff. Uh, and that's a, an important thing for me to remember. I'll never forget how detailed he was how on target he was. Uh, no one knew that. No, I think, I think a lot people, of people did not give him credit for that. They did not give him credit for that. Um, and the other thing I was noticing was how down to earth he was. Here he is in probably the most powerful room in the, in the world, and he's just interested in talking about what's going to happen if we do this. And it's, it's just no, just down to earth. Uh, his first issue, he signs off on immediately, it had to do with schools coming into compliance with certain aspects of the law. I have no problem with this, let's move on to this. The next one was a tough one. And what we tried to convey to him was that the way the law is written 
and the way the regulations are formulated, you need to realize that within a couple of years, there's a very strong possibility that most of the schools in the country will be labeled as failing. And that's gonna be tough for anyone to take. We don't think most of the schools are failing, but that's the, that's the outcome of the legislation. I always tell people writing laws is very messy, and this was a messy law. Um, he looked at that and sort of looked around the room and he said in so many words, I'm paraphrasing, so you're thinking this is perhaps good policy but bad politics. And we said yes. And so he said, well, you know, I'm gonna go where the numbers take me. I'm gonna go where the data takes us. And I'll let Carl Rove, he points to Carl Rove in the back of the room, I'll let Carl Rove deal with the politics. And that's one of those moments uh, you get an insight into the decision making of a chief executive. We can agree or disagree on the law, obviously, and the quality of it, but at this moment in time, he was driven by a need to make sure that his number one priority was not compromised in terms of where the numbers take us. And if we have to do a sales job, then we'll let the politicians do the sales job. My job is to improve America's schools. Just to be clear, Mr. Hickok, you're in the Oval Office and you're saying it's easy to project that a lot of schools are gonna be labeled as yeah. bad schools. Yeah. And you, Mr. President, are going to look bad as a result. Just, just saying. Yes, absolutely. That, that was your point. Absolutely. And did it, you have any reluctance saying that? Well, I, I felt an obligation to tell him. I mean, that was part of my job. I work for the president, and part of my job was to let, make sure he had the context of this decision. Two other things: the law itself really uh, said that by 2014 every school should be at a certain point in time. So this is a law that as written, this president would no longer be in office when its full impact was supposed to be felt. Uh, he never gets enough credit for that. And also it was a law aimed primarily at low performing schools. And a lot of those schools you have low income and high minority enrollments. He didn't get credit for that. So this, this was very consistent as far as I could tell on his part. His goal was to change American education and the numbers be damned. Same question I asked Mr. Marshall. As you sit here now, are you proud of No Child Left Behind? I think I'm proud of it for three things. One, and again, I think the president deserves all the credit for this, it made it impossible to ignore the achievement gap. We all know about it now. It's always been there. It's a huge problem in this country, and now America has to confront it. Uh, secondly, it heralded a new era of accountability. Now we can debate whether or not the way we measure accountability is good, but finally we're looking at results in American education. Most people don't remember, but prior to this accountability movement, most of it was about money. Money still matters. But for the president, it was all about accountability. And the third thing is transparency. People now can have a better sense of how well their schools are doing as parents, as taxpayers. That's kind of a cultural shift in American education. And President Bush, I think, deserves a lot of credit for that, along with a lot of governors who had to do, do the job of implementation. Let's move quickly back now to the Clinton administration where Louise Ware worked for six years as executive assistant to the Secretary of, of Veterans Affairs. Uh, this was a momentous period in uh, uh, many, many issues for the uh, to veterans of our wars at the time. Agent Orange was uh, the, the coverage of that, Gulf War Syndrome, whether or not the, the Veterans Administration covered that. Louise, tell us your perspective serving the president in that capacity. Okay, first of all, I, uh, as opposed to these, I was a lowly uh, Schedule C appointee, so I wasn't working directly with the president. I did work cl most closely with the Deputy Secretary, Herschel Goble, who was a friend of the president. He had been the Secretary of VA back in Arkansas for many years for President Clinton. Uh, but through them, I got to see uh, a lot of the things that were happening. And I have contacted him, as a matter of fact, contacted Herschel um, yesterday to, to talk to him about what were the greatest challenges. And it was a few things I worked directly on. Um, Working with budget and seeing the difference in OMB with the veterans, us fighting for needing money for veterans, and OMB watching the line, and I'm sure that's the same way in every agency out there. Uh, but VA is the second largest agency in government. People don't realize that, mm -hmm. but it is. it comes under the Defense Department, you know, but it's next in size. 
So working with them and then coordinating a lot of the changes we wanted to make with Department of Defense, like transferring medical records so that the people would be ready when they get out of service, we'd already have their records. And I, excuse me, but I feel like the VA would willing to move a little bit faster than the Defense Department on some of these things we are trying to get through. Uh, it, it was the same way uh, in cemeteries, and I did work directly on this. We were trying to get, um, the veteran service organizations had a real priority on having a modified a military funeral for every veteran that died. And the uh, Defense Department came back with a huge figure that it was going to cost. And so we had to really work on it getting down. And now, if you go to uh, any veteran's funeral, there is a small, they have a tape recording of taps, and they, of course they present the flag, which they had been doing, but they have uh, representatives there with the flags from a local veteran service organization. Well, we did that under, um, under President Clinton, because the veterans, it was really important to them. But one, <laughs> one of the main things, I think, and speaking of uh, uh, OMB, uh, Jesse Brown was our secretary at the time, fabulous cabinet secretary and loved by the veterans. And I think some of the other cabinet secretaries probably thought he was a little pushy because he, he would not, he wouldn't back down. And it was a time when it was limited money and he still kept fighting for money and ended up with an extra billion dollars. And I think others weren't, weren't real happy about that. But, uh, it, but they were your advocates um, for it. Now, Herschel said one of the hardest things is coming in with, we, and thanks to uh, Goody and uh, Vice President Goldwell heading up the reduction in, in personnel in this country. I mean, the um, people don't realize that Bill Clinton reduced government uh, to, back, uh, to back the levels of the Kennedy administration, I think. And at VA, we went from having 235,000 employees to 195,000 employees through attrition and some buyouts. We didn't fire anybody. and. It, it probably worked as good. It was through redundant positions that we ended up scaling back. Um, also very important, we started going to smaller, um, sort of like clinics as opposed to big hospitals. And we combined some of the hospitals where there was a little small hospital and a big hospital, we'd get join the administration and cut back on food service and stuff like that to save money. Uh, but the community-based um, centers now, we have them in Charlottesville and Lynchburg and Danville and all over the state, uh, were pretty much started under Clinton. And while we were there, I think we opened 600 of them. So it really brings the services closer uh, to the veterans. They don't have to travel nearly as far. It used to be just three hospitals in the state. And, and now there are lots of clinics they can go to if, uh, for their regular care. So anyway, I think um, that was some of the, the main things that they, uh, they got accomplished. Uh, one thing that I will have to say to me that surprised me, I think, the most, when I got to, I'd gone from an ABC board in Virginia with a big old office and beer, holders come, beer wholesalers come to you and, you know, uh, bowing at your feet and all, and I went to a little bitty cubby hole <laughs> in a big agency. Uh, but it, what, what surprised me so much was the quality of the workforce. Uh, when Steve Ratner, the car czar, was on TV after the GM buyout and all, it was over, I heard some of them ask him a question. What, what had surprised him the most? And I knew what his answer was gonna be. And it was the quality of the workforce. He was so surprised that you have that many hardworking <laughs> bureaucrats out there. You know, people think of them as bureaucrats, but they're really, uh, hard-working people. Um, I think, unfortunately, when we change administrations, especially, I guess, when you go from a Republican to Democrat or vice versa, you come in, the political appointees come in, and there's, there's no trust with the career people, and you have to really work on building up a trust. You, you know, a lot of them come in and think, well, we know more than anybody else, but all of the, the historians of the agency and the people that have been doing it for years are there. And so it probably would be better if we didn't come in every time and try to really, really rechange everything. 
Um, another major thing that we did, uh, that, that they did, I won't take credit, uh, was combining the National Cemetery Administration and the uh, Veterans Health Administration and the Veterans Benefits Administration. They'd all been so separate. And we tried to start forming a one VA so that a veteran would have one card that each place would know that they were in the system. We've got, they went to a lot to medical records so they can get their records down on a card. And they could, if they were in Florida in the winter in New Hampshire in the summer, that they could still, they could easily uh, transfer their, their benefits and their health care. So they worked very hard. It was a lot of internal things that they worked really hard on. But um, again, Gore did a great job in, <laughs> in reducing the size of government. Talking about the uh, the Al Gore reinventing government initiative, yeah. Mr. Marshall, you were in on that. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. The, uh, it was, it was there's one amazing. thing as you as you all speak. I, I hope you'll indulge me one very curious question for for those of you who have. Uh, worked with Congress and managed controversial votes or overseen votes or, or nominations in your case, Mr. Marsh. Have, um, have any of you been asked either by the president or a, a superior of any kind, a political superior of any kind, to do something that you really didn't want to do or apply pressure to someone on whom you really didn't want to apply pressure? That's right. <laughs> we have a taker. About two years into the implementation of No Child Left Behind, the Republicans still have the majority in the Senate, and the partisanship had become pretty rough. And so the Republican majority in the Senate made sure the Democrats didn't get any information, no hearings, nothing. And uh, we were told by the president's legislative staff that we need to have a private briefing for the Democrats behind closed doors because they're getting angry. And being a Republican administration, the last thing you want to do is close the doors behind an angry Democratic caucus, which included Senator Clinton and Ted Kennedy. These were individuals who had supported the legislation. Right. The reason I say it, it's something I didn't want to do was because it was a hornet's nest. The day before, <laughs> the Secretary of Education had referred to the NEA, the National Education Association, as a terrorist organization. So this was not going to be a good day. Uh, <laughs> And I'll never forget going into that room and Senator Kennedy coming up to us and saying, I'll oh, just relax. This is all off the record. I know there's lots of interest in what's going on. We know you made a mistake yesterday, Mr. Secretary, but we need to find out how things are going on this law. We have interest in this, obviously. So don't take it personal. It'll be fine. So we sit down at the conference table, and he sits at the other end of the conference table and starts screaming and banging on the desk and just yelling at the top of his lungs about how bad it was that he said what he said and how we don't have the information we need and you're holding out on us, blah, 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 blah. And I looked at the Secretary of Education and said, don't take it personal. <laughs> <laughs> don't take it personal. I mean, it was one of those moments where you realize this is part of what you have to do in the process of working with Congress and political parties. I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Marsh one more question, but in the meantime, what we're going to do after after this next last question goes to Mr. Marsh is open it up to questions from the floor. But Mr. Marsh, the last question I have for you, you know, th those of us who I, I cover TV news in Washington, I, I actually cover TV news anywhere in the country, but I'm based in Washington, and when and I'm often have often been asked to attend or cover events at the White House, and typically it's all very smooth. The press goes in, the president says what he says, uh, everything works fine. Sometimes, though, there are extraordinary stories behind the ceremonies that you see, and one of them is that day when President Ford was sworn in, becoming vice president, to president, which he had not known the day before. He did not know the day before he was going to be president. And the question, right, Mr. Marsh, was, where's the chief justice for the swearing in? Would you tell us what you did when you realized that you didn't know where the chief justice was? Well, you're, you're quite right. Mr. Ford did not know that he was going to be sworn in until 24 hours before it happened, that, that he would become president. Um, when the, the Friday morning or Thursday morning, he got a call after he'd been to a ceremony involving uh, deceased veterans. Uh, he got a call that he was to meet with Mr. Nixon, the president. Mr. Ford went over there at 11 o'clock. 
uh, and he came back and he said, the president has told me he's going to resign tomorrow at 12 and I, Jerry Ford, I will be sworn in. It gave you sort of an eerie feeling to suddenly realize that uh, the person before you is going to be president of the United States 24 hours from now. And Bob Hartman said to him, his press guy, he said, well, Jerry, who do you want to swear you in? And he said, uh, I'd like to have Chief Justice Berger. Mr. Berger was from the state of Michigan, which is Mr. Ford's state. And uh, so, so the president, president, vice president said to me, he said, Jack, get, find, see if you can get hold of, of uh, the Chief Justice. So I called the, the people who really, you ought to do a story about them, why. <laughs> yep. The greatest people in the world are the White House operators. They can run down somebody and find them when you don't think they exist. They, they are really good. I told this operator, one of the Chief Justice of the United States, she called back in two minutes. She said, Mr. Uh, Berger is not there. He's gone to international conference, and he's at The Hague in, uh, in Europe. And so for, Mr. Ford said, told me to call him, and so I did, and I got him on the phone. and. Uh, told him what the circumstance was. He said, I'd like to swear that, swear him in. Uh, but he said, I'll, I'll see, I can get back here. And I told him, I said, we, we'll survey traffic, air traffic coming out of Europe, and we'll also survey flights from the from, uh, United States to Europe. And I'll call Mr. you Mr. Marsh is being modest here. He had taken this job after being Assistant Secretary of Defense. <laughs> so, so I... Uh, at, at 4 o'clock, I remember the time well, at 4 o'clock, I called the Chief Justice of the United States, and I gave him this message that the President of the United States, because Mr. Nixon controlled the international travel of aircraft, the President of the United States is sending a, a, a 707 that looks just like a, a uh, looks like Air Force One, beautiful aircraft, and he sent it for you. you it's going to land at 6 o'clock. It has two crews on it. We had to put two crews on, so one crew will fly it over, one crew will fly it back because of the time problem. If you'd be there at 7 o'clock, that flight will bring you back to Washington. And, uh, of course, it did. He got there. We used a chopper and brought him in from Andrews into the White House. And he got there in time for the swearing in. And, uh, what I've often thought about the international travel who happened to be at that airport today when asked, what's that, why is that airplane here? And they realized that the aircraft had been sent by the President of the United States to bring back to swear in the Chief Justice of the United States who wrote, who wrote the unanimous opinion that caused Mr. Nixon to resign yeah. in order to bring the Vice President back, in order to bring the Chief Justice back to the United States to swear in the Vice President to be President. I've always felt that that's a tribute to our country and how we transition power. Uh, and that, I, I've often thought about that circumstance. It, it makes me actually feel very good. Yes, to, it does. To do that. Yes, it does. We do that. Questions from the audience, please. The microphone is right there. If you'll go ahead and, and fire away. Direct your uh, question to whom you want to ask. This is to Mr. Chopra. Um, I'm very concerned about um, the access to education, especially in light of the economic challenges that we have. And what I specifically want to address to you is that, you know, I, I, I see the future with the distribution of materials in, in uh, high schools and colleges going to notebooks because of the expense of um, publication of textbooks and also the fact that textbooks more and more have to be published annually to keep up with the new exchange of information. I will follow that up with the fact that even when underprivileged or economically challenged families have access to the internet and are given computers, they sit there because nobody teaches them how to use it. In addition, we have a challenge with the fact that urban children and urban people have ready access to Wi-Fi, but it is not so true in suburban and especially rural.
they're the ones who most need it. Speaking to your initiative in um, the Upper Mission of Michigan, this is leading to a digital divide, and if you project it down the road, we are in for a disaster. What are your ideas to change policy to address this? Number one, let me just upfront say we're in a great place on this topic. Uh, this is a bipartisan issue. Back when I served in Governor Kane's cabinet, it was Delegate Chris Peace who joined hands with the governor to bring forward, and Senator Watkins, if you know Senator Watkins, to bring forward this concept of open education resources and start to migrate our thinking in terms of the content in the Commonwealth. I want to share a vignette and then a um, very loaded question, which is probably in itself an hour-long uh, dialogue, and I'd love to follow up with you because I think it's uh, we have an opportunity. The um, Governor Kane at the time had invited Jim Batterson from the NASA uh, to serve as sort of a fellow in the governor's office prior to the review of the science standards. You probably – the standards of learning. And um, I came to learn something very depressing, that despite the fact that Virginia had ranked very highly in the quality of our science standards, uh, we were still teaching children, high school students, that the main component of a television is the cathode ray tube. This is in the in the uh, just a few years back, and uh, because of the cycle, the seven year cycle of the new standards, when the new books are published, when the procurement happens, we knew this fact in 07, 08, but it would not be fixed substantively until 2011, maybe 2012. It was not acceptable to Governor Kane, and we knew we had technological capacity to solve this. So that very summer, the, president, the governor uh, issued an open challenge. Will any one of Virginia's science teachers and anyone else who wants to help co-develop the physics material that's really, you know, kind of post-1950s so we'd have a little bit more modern stuff? So we, there's a Yahoo group email list of the 200 science teachers in Virginia, the physics teachers. So we emailed them, and boom, they hit the ground running. No one got paid a nickel, yet we had about – 20 volunteers, and William & Mary offered to curate this, make sure it was high quality, make sure that there were multiple rounds of review. We launched the Physics Flexbook version one for free, open and online the following March. So it was weeks and months, not years, before better content was available into Virginia's classrooms, all free. And just this last week, I was in uh, Virginia Beach. We announced that NASA has actually taken it further and taken it to the level of lesson plans and other materials, all freely available, all, all for everyone around the country. This is the solution to the digital divide. These devices will soon be, more likely versions of this, will be $99 in, not too, in the not too distant future. What we need to do is come up with a method of making sure that learning material is available and accessible in the same way your kids will remix their songs to create their own you know, music lists, if you will. We're going to be having kids remixing their le educational plans with teachers. So what's going to happen is the following. You know, the Internet is great, but today if you're a teacher and you want to find information about what, what lesson plans work in minority uh, districts, y the Internet's going to come back to you with gobbledygook. You need an Internet on top of the Internet. Collaboratively, we launched a standard called the Learning Registry, learningregistry.org. It's a tool to help teachers find all the learning material on the internet today that has ratings and reviews and available. Are you a member of the Learning Registry? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, LearningRegistry.org. So uh, this is a free resource for everyone around the country. And uh, the great news is Virginia is going to hopefully be a leader in, in the adoption of this. But if you combine teachers being able to remix lesson plans and the ability to share it and devices fall, in uh, York County, Eric Williams, a superintendent, has a bring your own device policy. You can bring these technologies into the classroom and they will allow you to connect and to use this information. I'll leave you with one final vignette. I visited the Los Altos School in California, the first place that took the Khan Academy uh, into the fifth grade math. I met a regular old fifth grade kid who finished calculus. Why? Because today, with all, forgive my French, we have a derrieres and seats policy for how we learn. We all sit in the classroom when we listen. But what we're moving towards is performance-based or competency-based learning. Will you learn at your pace, and as you get smarter, you get to the next level? Your kids play video games, and as they succeed in World of Warcraft, they open up the next level. 
That logic is what these new tools use. And so the Khan Academy allowed this kid to take the lesson plans, learn the material, take the tests along the way, perform at a high standard. He was so addicted, three hours a night he spent. Finished calculus in the fifth grade. So Matt. it's a longer answer to this. I go on for hours, but it's coming and it'll be happening in Virginia. Mark my words. What I want to know, though, is how do you reach? I mean, you're talking about the upper 10%. I got it. We'll talk about One thing, can, you, can, I, can we have our next one? Can I just point out that only in a panel like this are we going to discuss Chief Justice Burger and World of Warcraft at the same time? <laughs> Can Sorry. we have one last question, Sorry. please? That's, no, no, that's wonderful. One last question, please, sir. Um, I hate to ask a question for the same person, but um, I actually, I was wondering if you were familiar with the, what's called the Maine Learning Technology Initiative um, implemented by former Governor Angus King up in Maine. Um, uh, I was just wondering, um, as far as uh, implementing it on a national level with the broadband initiative, um, what do you plan to do as far as um, combating the issue of um, of children in the very rural areas Correct. without the infrastructure already Correct. in place? So just very simple answer. Um, the main learning initiative separates what I call nouns and verbs. So technology is often seen as a noun. Can I buy these devices? One-to-one um, -one computing. Every kid in Maine gets a, a basically a laptop. And the uh, very important concept, we have it in Henrico, actually. We have an initiative like this. The problem is that... Uh, you're not getting at the root cause of the problem, which is understanding what the information is being, con you know, there are probably 50 ways to teach basic concepts of math. For each child, what's the right method for the right child at the right time? And that's gonna, you need to, to personalize. Walmart knows with absolute precision what coupon to run to make sure that you get that product. The kind of analytics they have to make that happen, if we had Walmart analytics on what lesson plan and material is in front of your child at the right time, our kids are gonna learn like that. The 98% um, mobile broadband, that the wireless initiative, that will provide really a public-private partnership. Each state's going to have to implement this, but a public-private partnership so that not only is our first responders going to have access to this, but schools and others can have that lower the cost for them to get connected. So 98% of the people in the private sector will benefit because of the capital investment to get our cops and firefighters connected. So it's, a, again, longer answer to your simple question, but the National Wireless Initiative will give us a roadmap to connect 98% of the population, and it'll happen in short order. Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to conclude our panel. I'm sure the panelists would uh, entertain questions from you after we're able to adjourn. Can I just personally thank you all, all of you, um, first of all, for your government service. Obviously, it matters. It's, it's, it's terrific to have great people serving in government. Also, thank you very much for your participation in the panel. It was a great conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, our Virginians in the White House. Thank you very, very much. Uh, you see why why it is so good. His, his youngest son, Christian, is here. And uh, Christian is the only one who so far hasn't come to the University of Virginia. I always like to see why, because really I look at him and I see, well, at least $200,000 he's poured into the University of Virginia through, through his kids. And we told Christian he has to come too. Christian wasn't sure, but I just sold the deal, Why? You know how I did it? I promised to tell him several stories about you from our time in high school. So he... That we could. We, Christian just got a get out of jail free card, three or four of them later in life. But Wyatt did a fantastic job. Please join me in giving him a round of applause. <laughs> and finally, where is Bruce? Is he here? Did he come in? Where is Bruce? Oh, there you are. You're sitting. Now stand up. I, I've got one other person that I really want you to acknowledge. Uh, Bruce Vilk here has been with us for five years, uh, been with Center for Politics, and he has literally put together three dozen major conferences and uh, speaker events for the Center for Politics, and I can truthfully say never once was a single detail left out of place. He has done them perfectly. Sadly for us, he has gotten a, a ter another terrific job that I'm afraid I can't compete with in terms of salary. Wyatt cut us off.
Uh, and and so we, we've lost Bruce, but I want him to know how much we've appreciated everything he's done. And if you've been at our conferences, you've benefited from his work. Please give him an ovation. Don't forget to look at our website, The Crystal Ball. Uh, you get it every Thursday, sign up for free, and we've also got the Youth Leadership Initiative resources available to all of you who are teachers and students, and we want you to look at that website. Just go to centerforpolitics.org, centerforpolitics.org, and get our free materials, your tax dollars at work. Thank you all for coming today. Exactly. So, yeah, this, there's a competition at the district level. Right, okay, individual well, I just wanted to say that.